we have a whole spectrum of folks here, from the early pioneers to folks for whom today is the first connection. Uh, and I just wanted to hear like a voice of one or two folks from each bar about what really brought you into this. Uh, we could begin <laughs> anywhere, uh, but maybe, you know, you've heard a lot from the, the pioneers of this work already. What about some of the newcomers? What, for folks who've just joined today, just a word or two about what is it that really made it worth your while to be in this room today? You have many other choices. What drew you here? Please. Uh, my name is Amber Jones. Um, I just graduated with my MBA from Case, but I've been working with the Old Brooklyn Community Development Corporation as their community health coordinator. And this, we started our work in community health um, more than two years ago. And so just kind of seeing who else do this work and how it can be involved. That's great. Somebody else, a newcomer, first time connected to Hip Cuyahoga. What did it? It's a place you got to talk. There's no partnership if there's no talk. Please. I'm Rachel Nagel, Cleveland Metro Parks. I manage the outdoor recreation program. So we're looking how, at each time we back that we can have a boarding winter sport, how we can continue to integrate health and wellness into our program and looking to branch out to other students. Excellent. What about uh, folks who've been at it for a year or so? Today's not your first day, but, but you've got a little bit more of a perspective on it. Got 16% of you. Somebody just voted, please. Uh, so my name is Jacob Vance. I work at Bike Cleveland, and my, my answer may be incorrect. I know I've been in different MC meetings <laughs> over the years for a while, but I think you know, this year is the year we've kind of really cemented our organization and, and working with MC through the new reach grant. Um, so I think for, for me, it's really how can we elevate our work, uh, not just in Cleveland, but across the county to really um, improve the environment for people biking and walking. Yeah, that's, there are no wrong answers to a question like that, right? Connected because you're aware is one thing. Connected because you actually feel like you're working now because there's a means to express what you do routinely through this platform and with them. That's a, a really meaningful distinction and it's worth, worth saying it that way. Thank you. Um, what about the, the largest group? Two to four years, right? That's the, that's the area where this work really began to flourish, right? It became public. Other people, I learned about it at a distance. Um, what about those of you here in this room? What brought you into it a couple years ago? Hi, my name is Marie. I'm with the Center for Travel and Health at UNC Hospital. And I was very inspired to see a consortium group that had eliminated racism as one of its primary um, aims. Yeah, I could probably count on one hand how many other folks have been that open, that conspicuous, that committed to something like that. Absolutely. Somebody else from the two to four year range? Yeah, please. Hi, my name is Srini Vasmarugu. I'm with United Healthcare's uh, Medicaid Managed Care Plan here in Ohio. And uh, I've been kind of sort of in and out with uh, HIPSI, so I feel somewhat connected. I live in Cleveland, I love Cleveland, and so that's kind of part of why I first started going to these. But then, as uh, someone who works for a managed care Medicaid plan, um, I'm still trying to figure out how we fit into this, and so I have both a professional and a personal kind of interest in it. Um, so, okay, yeah, again. that's not uncommon, right? The, the the group is gelling, but lots of folks are lurking around the edges. What is it? Sounds interesting. How do I connect into it? It's a very familiar sort of periphery, but now in the room, right? That's great. Um, five to six years. Those are those are some hardcore folks. What was it back then? Right, that was 2012, something like that. Somebody voted. Please, yeah. So I'm Jody Mitchell, and I originally got involved at the beginning when I was with the foundation, and so we were help, helping to fund this work. Uh -huh. I have stayed involved because of diffusing this work um, to not only our local partners, but also my work with some federal partners, and to make sure that the voice is being heard in the great work. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, the people who helped stand it up are probably the best spokespeople for where, where uh, who else needs to know about it. That's right. Um, okay, well, let's do these last two groups together, seven to eight, or, or pre, the prehistory of Hip Cuyahoga. What was going on back then that brought you into it? Please. that uh, we're doing a good job. But for me, the most important thing was that it brought 
Right. Right. At the time, right, ACA was still in the ethos. Right. Right. <laughs> Very good. Uh, another founder? Somebody else in the early pioneer days? Since Gail spoke, I need to, uh, she reminded me of something that uh, she said, Gail is saying, about this work around the assessment process. You know, public health had a mandate, and we were thinking about how do we meet that mandate and think about the partnerships that we need to form using a, a guideline from a national organization. We began walking through that sort of in a deliberate way, which is task-oriented. And Gail uh, raised her hand, and she said, Gary, she says, is this just about you guys seeking your accreditation? Are we really going to do something? <laughs> People that know Gail would be surprised, and I think that was, I'll never forget that really stop and, and refocus uh, how we were doing our work and what it was about. Um, and so I think that sticks with me. I love that story because getting accreditation is a really meaningful step, right? I mean, there, it's a dis, it's a institutional commitment that matters, but it's not the whole story. And, and that's true for a lot of this work, that people are in it because they see you know, an immediate step and others see that as a step towards something greater. Um, that's one of the principles of bringing multiple institutions, multiple people together um, who actually have a uh, you know, uh, different vantage point on the nature of the system that we're a part of and our own roles as change agents within it. So that's going to be a theme that we're going to unpeel or uh, unpack um, quite a bit here. Um, Can I just say Yeah, please. <coughs> Yeah. And it's very, it's, it's a real challenge. And I think that the education and stuff that you talked about is really critical, but it takes a long time to do that. And it takes a long time to get people to feel like their voice counts and that it's important. And you know, I'm, I'm with somebody here who doesn't worry about that. She opens her mouth and says what she thinks. But not everybody's willing to do that. And they, you know, they've been, um, yeah, they've been intimidated. Yeah. And so I think that what Greg said is pretty important. Yeah, it's a, great, it's a great point here. We've got kind of a living history. We've heard this group started small and, and has grown uh, three, four fold in the last several years. So there's, it's into the hundreds of people in this room and thousands of people on a list. But, but you know, whose voice is really in it? Um, who hasn't even been touched by it that probably ought to? And if we're asking, you know, looking ahead, What's going to bring the next new people into this work? What, what will um, matter enough to them that it's worth their time and energy to contribute to this? And so some of the preconditions for that, um, that next new contact is going to be built by the people who show up right now. And, and it's a great question. We can do more of the same, or we could really stretch. Uh, and what will that do to the work that's already underway and to the larger promise of the work itself? That's a great point. Um, I add one more thing. Yeah, she please. just reminded me of, we were just having the same conversation <laughs> about that. And one of the pieces that I added too was that there's also this work around the institutional partners, not just speaking humility, but practicing it. Yeah. So in order to prepare to even have the community voice be elevated, you have to learn how to manage the power dynamics amongst the institutions. So a lot of the what Heidi and Greg were talking about in the beginning, that preparation work is also is happening on every level. It's not just figuring out, you know, you definitely want to um, approach people who are affected by it the most, but you have to make sure that the condition is such that when they get there that they do understand that the people in the room know the power dynamics. They're not acting like they're not there, yeah. but they're figuring out how do you practice that humility so that everybody can yeah. really authentically show up as a human being. That's a great, it's a great point because we could have the intention for everybody to have a voice, but if in fact some people are voiceless in this work, then the, the discipline is to go back again and try to restructure the circumstance so that it works differently the next time, right? Mm -hmm. Action and reaction. And if if, if you aren't getting the kind of um, plural conversation that you want, then that becomes an obligation on the part of the, the 
the, the parties who, were, who espouse that to actually figure out a better way to make it happen. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, there are always folks who can help figure out why that meeting didn't go the way you thought it was mm -hmm. going to go. Um, so, you know, we're, we are working in a system, uh, and our health and well-being depends on a system that was designed long ago. None of us <laughs> really had a hand in shaping that, and yet we are experiencing the consequences of it. It's going to continue into the future unless we do something differently about it. And, you know, the very fact that this consortium has, has um, formed and that all of you are here is sort of a moment of optimism that, you know, we, the system was made, it can be remade, but we're going to have to understand that it is something that we are a part of. It's bigger than we can see. It's, it's, uh, it's more vast than we can really understand. That doesn't mean that we can't have a huge influence on changing it. Uh, and, and so that's kind of the, the anchor of inclusion that, <laughs> you know, Greg and, and all of this work has rightfully acknowledged that nobody is exempt from this system, even the ones that are kind of doing better within it, who's, who have advantages um, and, and who bear many of the benefits, it doesn't mean that they're um, insulated from the systemic challenges that actually threaten everybody's health and well-being when you live in a society that isn't um, achieving sort of fair and just opportunities for everybody. So um, I, I mentioned that, <laughs> You know, I came to understand this work as, um, as the health improvement plan was published. There's some people who love, you know, mysteries and drama and true crime. I actually read these health improvement plans. It's a, a very, very weird genre, I promise you. But when something great comes up, it's conspicuous. It's very obvious. And, uh, and the hard work that went into this, the brilliance of being able to put together, you know, not just a blizzard of data that then say we have all these priorities and good news we've got a huge coalition that's ready to do all of it. That wasn't the nature of this document at all. It was we have a lot of challenges and we're going to be disciplined about picking the ones that really could be a platform into structural change. Racism, chronic disease, community linkages, you know, a various process um, commitments that we're going to do this in a way that is different than we've done it before, um, separate from the content of the policies and programs and issues that we're going to lift up. That was not normal, right? To have it in a disciplined thing and to have so many people be a part of it. Um, what you're talking about here then elevates the stakes, right? The minute you weigh in with that kind of commitment, uh, it, it now turns into something um, uh, much more provocative, right? We're dealing with entrenched structures. They're interconnected. They're increasing. Much of this work is not sort of you know, a luxury that we could change if we need to. Things are getting worse in many respects. Um, and so this is not a neutral playing field, very costly. I don't need to go through this full bullet list. Um, but, but every one of those is a good reason for a systemic response. And when you add them all together, you're going to end up with a situation that, um, that is going to defy every quick fix, right? It's going to require a very disciplined system-wide strategy um, these three words, are if, you know, if you walk out of this room and remember nothing else, whatever that ha has to happen, it has to be led, designed, and financed by people who actually feel themselves to be owners of and members of and agents within this common hip Cuyahoga enterprise. And they have to be willing to work together differently, together. Um, that's a tall order. Uh, but the work continues, right? Even after putting that bid down, <laughs> it's gotten bigger and stronger, right? Other people may have filtered off, but newer people come into this work because of the magnitude of that vision. Um, so let's take a little poll, right? So from what you know to be, this is not like only hip Cuyahoga, right? This is about the, the current strategies of change, the collective stuff that you know is underway within your own organization, within your own neighborhoods, you know, sort of when you look at the scene around here, how confident are you that the way that things are going, you know, things are headed is going to deliver the results that you want? Keep voting if you haven't yet. Uh, ooh, <laughs> the all-in person who is sure undid their own vote. What's with that? <laughs> Wait a minute. Is that just a mis mistyped or did doubt creep in just because of the 71% the of others who have cautious optimism? Okay, such is, such is the, the mood of the room. Going with the folks that feel a little bit more confident, what is, what's the source of your optimism, right? I mean, obviously, 
nobody's ready to, to, to say this is the way. Uh, but for those that are very confident, and there are a few of you in this room, what's the source of your, the basic source of your confidence, of your optimism? Where is it coming from? Please. It just seems like everybody who's bought into this idea of social determinants of health now, everyone at least understands it and feels it's important from payers to government, to Republican government, all the way up. And um, now it's a now it's a task of operationalizing it. But with the with the wave behind that, with the support behind that, at least intellectually, and hopefully we'll get somewhere else. Yeah, it's not a bad answer, right? <laughs> I'm, you know, it's taken decades to get across to the American people and institutions that health is more than health care. And, and now, what are we going to do about it and how? But that's a big, you know, historical shift. Lots of people would have rather pretend that we didn't have to go through all that, uh, you know, sort of, um, uh, you know, sort of wicked problems in order to promote health. But there's just no way to treat your way into a better health and well-being. You're going to have to actually create a society that supports that. Um, more and more people understand that. There's an overwhelming amount of data that is now, you know, kind of gotten through to people. Great answer. Um, anybody else in the confidence group that, yeah, please. Uh, for me, it's the reality that uh, because of people in the community, we have uh, Medicaid. Uh-huh. Yeah, what a story, right? We're living in a natural experiment in the US right now on whether states are going to participate in certain policy decisions or not. That, that, those experiments are very conspicuous, but they don't happen by accident. Real people have to make that happen in every jurisdiction for it to happen at a statewide level. I love it. Um, folks who are feeling a little bit more cautious, what's, what's your sense of, wait a minute, we're going to have to rethink this a little bit or we don't have enough going for us yet. Please. Um, you know, I'm relatively new to the group, but part of what I feel like I see may not be accurate is, um, I agree, I think there's a lot of people talking about it now, and more people than I, I have heard discussing it, but uh, A, I, I feel like there's just a lot of, of still competition, almost. There's a lot of different groups doing a lot of different things. Right. And there's overlap, and I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I don't know. And at the same point, I just feel um, that there's a lot of good strategies, but I haven't necessarily seen them go to like action items. Right. Yeah, we're like, okay, let's hit the road, let's, let's go to the ground and start doing it. Yeah. Yeah, and, and even, even Heidi acknowledged that this has been a kind of inward building time, but how does it connect, how does it become the new normal, right? That's an open question, and, and plenty of worthy ideas never really get traction, so how do we know that this one is going to do it? That's a great question. Um, please. Um, I just feel like oftentimes we're um, we, still... We want to get these voices on. Um, oh, yeah, okay, good. I'm so sorry. That's right. If, if it's worth saying, it's worth <laughs> recording, right? <laughs> We, we certainly so there's the idea of uh, being uh, uh, upstream of, of health impacts and trying to affect things beforehand, but I think we're still downstream of economic factors right. uh, that we don't have much control over, and uh, that we'll always be battling against those until something else changes that. Uh huh. Good. Good point. Right. There's always sort of another layer of the onion, and are we really? Um, everywhere we want to be. Let's get last two points over here and then we'll move on. Yeah, I hear that. Basically, the two prior comments focus on what I was going to say, and that the group's very committed, and we 
shown some results. But I am still concerned with the political environment today uh -huh. and where some of the funding will lead to do some of the things will come from. And that concerns me too. The economic environment in which Cuyahoga County residents reside within. And also, what is the administration's um, support for some of the kinds of uh, programming that will be uh, dollars needed for? Yeah. It's a great point. We're going to get to this theme as we, as we get deeper into this conversation. You know, knowing what you can and cannot do within a wider environment is, is part of the discipline of, of being um, focused and effective, but it's also a question about the extent to which that environment can change, and if so, how and by whom. And so we want to keep a bifocal view of the local and the larger forces, uh, and that's a plenty good reason for concern if you're not really geared up to, to, um, to, to really focus on that wider environment. Um, so one thing we know for decades, right, th there has been consciousness that we have a badly designed, very dysfunctional system. Um, doesn't matter what your principal uh, orientation to it is. It could be health or economics. Um, we've got signs in every sector that, that, um, th that the aspirations for, th that our collective aspirations are not really um, being delivered by the system as built. It can never really change, honestly, unless the handful of preconditions are in place, right? People have to want it to change. And we've talked about a system that works for many people. And even, even any change, even change for the better, is actually got a lot of inertia and resistance to it. And so people have to actually want the system to change. And what's going to make that happen? You're talking about perspective transformation. You're talking about different people getting out of their own routine and doing something different. That's, that's a foundational, right? If you can't make that happen, then it will just be talk. It will just be on the margins of a, of, you know, of a big enterprise that you know, is headed somewhere we don't happen to like, but we don't not really geared up to change it very much. So you have to want it, you have to know what it entails, you have to actually begin doing business differently, and to the point that we just heard, you have to create environments that actually enable this to happen. And those are cultural, those are policy, those are, those are you know, economic and structural, um, and, and you know, we don't have to treat that as a black box. We could be very specific about under what circumstances this work can flourish and under what circumstances it's being inhibited. Um, so the, 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 at the essence of it, we're dealing with uh, a pattern of fragmentation, of disconnection, of, 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 of some relationships, organizational, decision authority, the, the criteria we use, the resources and how they flow, the power and the prestige, it's all kind of built um, in small categories it's, and, and you know, for particular beneficiaries, right? Very countercultural to actually think about all the people and a large encompassing system, commitments to inclusion. Those are not what most of our organizational lives or social lives are, are founded upon. So the root of this problem is fragmentation, of that kind of disconnection. And it could lead to a, a feeling of stuckness, even within an initiative, even within a consortium that is growing, that has you know, really impressive aspirations, that is, has, that is a track record of doing things that uh, other places would, would envy. Uh, but it can still feel like, wait a minute, the real progress we're here for is so out of reach because it requires all this interdependence, right, Heidi? I use the word interdependence multiple times. And that interdependence can be energizing if you feel like you can activate it. It can be very paralyzing if you think, well, everyone's going to have to change a little bit for us all to move forward. So how do we get through that sense of interdependence um, when there is so much disconnection, disenfranchisement, um, and actually you know, competitive or hostile actors? Not everybody agrees and wants the same things in a messy democratic society. That pluralism is real. There's going to be conflict. Um, so how do you move forward? That could be a very dismal state, um, uh, except I'll just say where, where I and our organization draws some optimism is from Eleanor Ostrom, who was uh, a founder of Rethink Health. Did anybody know who Eleanor Ostrom was, right? She was the first woman to no win the Nobel Prize in economics in 2009, uh, a few years before she, was, she and a handful of others had helped create Rethink Health as, as an organization devoted to focusing on the systems that we're a part of. And, and her research, I'm going to completely you know, <laughs> simplify and, and caricature you know, a, a, a career's work, but it, it was basically about the tragedy of the commons, that, that people who are interdependent, who rely um, for, their, for their very lives and livelihoods 
on certain conditions, um, very often uh, collapse, right? Families, corporations, businesses, one group gets more than they all need and the whole thing collapses for everybody. That tragedy of the commons is very, very real. Um, Eleanor's research uh, demonstrated another thing, which is it doesn't always happen that way. In, in many, many cases, hundreds of cases across the world in different systems, in, and in, she was mostly dealing with fisheries and forestries and water resources and land, uh, things that people actually depend on. They have vital interests around, and when the, when the interests are strong enough and the circumstances are right, and I'll tell you what those circumstances are in a second, um, it, it isn't destiny that we will all you know, sort of collapse in a race for myself. People actually negotiate and then live by shared norms. And by live by, I mean enforce. Like, this is how we're gonna do it around here, and if you don't, then, then the sanctions get stronger and stronger on how we can make a common life together where some people don't live at the expense of other people living at all. Um, and what it is is, is an act of, of stewardship, of inter interdependent stewards recognizing they are part of a common world. Um, and it's not a strong state that makes that happen in her research. And it's not an unchecked market. It's complicated um, rules and agreements that people make democratically with each other. This is something that we are capable of doing. Sure, we're competitive, um, but we also have a propensity for collaboration. That's kind of how human society has evolved the way it has. And, and that's the test of our time now, is can we retrieve the sense of interdependent stewardship in a common world, but we have to treat it like it's in our vital interest to do it together because the default, the opposite, is to do it in smaller, fragmented groups that actually perpetuate even more fragmentation. Um, so to some degree, that's the, the, the canvas, the backstory on how um, it, it feels like it could be within reach, but it's, it's hard and very mighty work. Um, so uh, as we've thought about this, we've come to understand over and over again that this is a developmental process. You can't build stewardship instantly. Right? The, the, the capabilities of what one or more than one party is able to do are not really fully formed until you actually work out those relationships and to build and knit together what is it that we are thinking about and doing. I love the, the, you know, the commitment to think, understand, and act. Um, and that happens in a number of ways developmentally. Um, uh, I won't go through the details of this other than to say that Having a developmental framework, just like understanding what an infant can and cannot do and what a child can do, I mean, just like human development has certain expectations and capabilities and, and um, adults are patient with children when they know they, they cannot do things. We need to be patient with each other about what we can and cannot do in a, in a collaborative that is just beginning to form. Um, so this developmental framework is one that we've used and developed and refined and even this version of it is a little bit new. Uh, hot off the press, but underneath it are definitions and, and metrics and, and ways of differentiating what can be expected as groups are just coming together versus beginning to see that they actually have common regional goals that are beginning to see that you know what we're going to need here is an interdependent portfolio, something we don't have right now. Um, and, and then the hard task, the real steep uh, learning curve or you know, growth curve is about actually making those things come to life and making them the new normal, right? So that's, that's to some degree the journey that Hip Cuyahoga has been on for these several years, right? You, you came from a disorganized uh, sort of separated set of folks and have come together into a place that is somewhere in the middle. And middle adolescence of anything is, is hard. It's complicated. It's awkward. There's tensions. I, I love the transparency with which, uh, you know, this room was set because that's developmentally where this work is. And what you can see in there is that even success brings the next level challenge, right? You can organize a, a you know, a immunization campaign. And then, then what, right? So the, in some groups, that's the worst thing that can happen is it's successful, they don't know what else to do, they're not set up, they don't see it as capacity building, and they disband, and, and it, was a, it was an immunization campaign. Great for that topic, but not what we would call <coughs> system change. Uh, and so that's the whole nature of this crooked path is it gets harder at every step precisely because you're learning and growing and that step is capacity building. But you can also fall off that. You can end up in, in, in um, you know, long loops of confusion or, um, or you know, plateau or even reversals. Um, I won't even narrate that. So, 
So what's it going to take to move from leadership around myself and my organizational interests to stewardship of our common, our common uh, world? There's a little checklist here, uh, pros and cons to this framework, but, but I only put it up here to say that you know, nothing is really going to mean uh, much in this quest for system change if you're not actually making structural change. Policies, practices, resource flows, those things have to get restructured. But, but we can't wave a wand to make that happen, right? It, it comes because those things are rooted in relationships and power dynamics and who's connected to whom, um, you know, who's thinking about whom. You've got that question in the Arches study. Um, and then deep underneath of it, what's our mental model? Is my organization the principal organizing unit for everything I do? Is my job a private paycheck and, and it has no wider public significance? There are lots of mental models at foot here. Is health bigger than health care? You know, th is there something about health that's really inextricably related to the economy? Uh, how we think about those things, what's in and out, um, how we group the containers is really what the mental model part of this is all about. And, um, and, and we need this whole structure to happen. The truth is you've got things going on at all levels of this, right? Their mental models are shifting among some, but it hasn't moved into power dynamics yet, or the power dynamics are there, but those people's mental models is still, is still um, you know, not widely shared with others. So playing in this soup is potentially very, very confusing if there isn't a way to back up and say, okay, wait, with whom and where are we making progress and where, um, where have we even yet to really name the issue? Um, and I see this as a, you know, just as a critical friend, you've got an amazing opportunity here with approaches that uh, you know, are very much oriented around those fundamental mental models, different ways of working with each other, commitments to, to, um, you know, to community engagement and collective impact, um, and, and you know, a, a bold experiment to say health and equity will be in the foreground whenever we think of anything. Right? Those are approaches that have, at, by their very nature, transformative character to them. Um, at the same time, you've got priorities that are you know, specific to e eating and active living and uh, you know, community and, and, and linkages and, and you know, new ways of gathering data. There's a, you know, those are pretty, um, uh, pr pretty direct and you know, even transactional, uh, but, but without which there would be no work on Monday. You know, what are you going to do uh, with these grand aspirations? And so those two things can live in a very virtuous way, right? New perspectives can lead to new kinds of action. New kinds of action reinforce that perspective. And so those things go together. But we should also recognize the vicious potential there, right? If, if the transformative character of this starts to erode, or you skip it, or, or it goes you know, into the background, then the transactional stuff is the path of least resistance. And that becomes everybody does their little piece, and it isn't really transformative. And the least, you know, as the transformative potential shrinks, so do the need to, to, um, to act a little differently. And so this dynamic, it goes either way. They both are mutually reinforcing. The question is how can you manage this consortium in ways that lift up both elements of it because there are people in here that are needed and have skills in both areas, right? So I'm just naming that as a, as a fundamental tension in a lot of this work. The good news is you have foundations in both. Some groups are way off the scale on one or the other, and they don't have both. You've got both, but now you're, you, in some ways, have inherited a challenge of trying to do both simultaneously. Now, so we have to make room for more than one, um, more than one skill set, more than one way of looking at this work. Um, and a lot of it has to do with how we think about the future, right? If this isn't about you know, uh, you know, long-term change, then then you know, what is it? On the other hand, how do you get to the long term? Some people think, and not rightly or wrongly, I'm just saying some people think that you get to the long term by going through the short and the medium, right? How many people actually, I didn't put this as a poll, but just raise your hand. How many people think you get to the long term by going through the short and the medium? Yeah, come on. Yes, come on. How many people think that's right? Of course, right? It sounds logical. I mean, who wouldn't say that? Um, there is another way to look at it, which is we have, at any moment in time, the short things are happening, some medium things are happening, and some long things are happening, right? It's all kind of happening in the moment. Very hard to see it that way. 
Um, one of my favorite frameworks is, the, is this thing called Three Horizons. And I'm just going to narrate it quickly, and then we'll talk through it. Um, so uh, the idea of Three Horizons is just what I just said. There's, there's more than one time scale happening at any moment. So the first one is what's common, right? The y-axis here is prevalence, what's happening routinely, what's going on over and over again. Most of us are doing it, whatever that is, right? And so, so um, that's kind of business as usual, right? It's, it's high on prevalence because it's happening. Uh, on the other hand, it's declining because it's losing its fit for purpose, right? That the, that the, by definition, if we want there to be better health and well-being, certain things in the in business as usual are going to have to change in order to produce better health and well-being. And so, so this first horizon is, is, you know, is sort of what's happening now, but over time it's got to decline if, if there's going to be change and transformation. Um, it doesn't ever go away fully, right? We're not trying to eradicate the, the present fully. Uh, on the other hand, we are trying to take certain aspects of business as usual and bring them down in order that, um, that other things may come true. So let's just take a quick second. Um, because this is important, right? Many of us have jobs that are about keeping the lights on and the, the payroll paid, and, and we're managing, right? We're managing in the present. Um, so what is it, uh, just a, you know, a quick popcorn here, what is it that you have to manage? Or what is it that you, know, you see as business as usual right now that just sort of defines for you business as usual? Things you manage, things that you have to take care of. Just say a word or two. No judgment here, whatever it is. Compliance. Compliance, right? There's laws, exactly. What else? <laughs> budgets. budgets. <laughs> Two on budgets. <laughs> what else? Programs. Programs, right? These things are built. They have to get continued. Very often they have a life of their own and they, they, want, they need to be renewed. Absolutely. Staff development. Staff, exactly. Right. Other things. Right. Managing existing relationships. Yeah, all those existing relationships. Who do you spend time with, right? Who gets the appointment? Who doesn't? All of that. Exactly. Um, we're going to do abbreviated versions of this, but I think you can get the idea already that if you ask people seriously about what's, what they attend to because, they're, because they believe they are managing it, that's a whole class of knowledge and, and, and content. The, the other way is to look at the, the vision, right? This is the... The, the picture of the viable future. Uh, by definition, this is uncommon in the present, right? It's, it's lowest on the, y, on the y axis because not many people are acting that way. Not many people are doing it very differently or thinking very differently. Um, over time, you'd like to see that grow. This is the domain of visionaries, right? What is it that um, is rising in this culture? What is it that is um, you know, kind of a bold direction for the future that some people hold out even in the present, right? What is it? What do you see as rising? We've even heard some of this in Heidi's talk already today. Disease burden. Yeah, well, sure, but, what, but, but, but in terms of people acting, right? This is, sure, yes, there are trends that are, that are at play here. I'm talking about human behavior, though. What is it that people are doing because they see a new vision of the future in the present? Yeah, there you go, right? Some people see this as cultural healing, as a cultural expression, cultural survival. Perfect answer. Others? I would say racial consciousness. Yeah, racial consciousness, right? We're becoming a more multicultural society, and that produces you know, a lot of heat and tension. Some people are encouraging of it, others aren't. Um, but it's definitely a trend that is part of a, of a, of a, you know, a visioning thing. We're not the same. We're not the same race-oriented society that we've been even just a few years ago. Good, good point. Right? Feel on that one? In between these is what we call a process bridge. Um, this is the sort of the, the domain of entrepreneurs. These are folks that are not sticking with the status quo, but nor are they the total visionary willing to work over the long haul. They're trying to find something else in the middle, right? This is what's being tested, what's in the innovation space word or two on that. What do you see as the, the edges of what people are trying to do differently, but, but it, it isn't what you'd call full-on you know, vision? What's getting tested? Some of the work around social determinants of health maybe at this point. Say a word, like which ones or what, so what topics? So housing, I think, yeah. is an interesting one. Yeah, housing is the top of the list, right? When a hospital decides, look, we're going to have to go outside the walls of our clinical operation, 
housing and transportation are the top, right? Because it's just a slam dunk. Food pharmacy. Sorry, food pharmacy, right? Uh huh. Good point. Nonprofit and for-profit organizations working together. Yeah, exactly. Even all of Collective Impact will throw in the middle there. Uh, sure, that's Reading good. Say it again. Screening and referral for social Screening, services. yeah, exactly. All that kind of screening or you know social need assessment. We could even put in um, you know trauma informed care, which is really about the present, recognizing there was trauma in the past. We haven't yet geared up for ending the trauma itself. Okay. So uh, here's another poll, right? I mean, this is this is not. There's no judgment. All of those are real. All of them are happening simultaneously. There's no such thing as a process of social change that does not involve all of those parties together. So the question is, if you have a sort of a default mode, the one that you are most ordinarily focused on, um, just, just get a little mini picture of who's in this room, uh, where do you spend most of your time and energy? Yeah, that's fair. Um, <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll go. We'll go with your higher spirit at the moment. Where, where you really, where you really get it from, right? Where does your energy come from? Um, many of us are in jobs that don't allow that to get its full expression. But that's maybe one of the reasons why a, you know, another vehicle, another forum to um, do work that we can't do in our day jobs, um, is proof of why. We, there are certain things you can't do alone. You really need each other to be able to make happen. Um, so this is a nice little spread. I mean, I, I, I might have guessed that this was a room of visionaries. Um, but it would be disappointing, frankly, if this was nothing but visionaries, right? If you didn't have entrepreneurs here, if you didn't have managers in this room, you would question the, the, the power and the platform and the, and the um, agility of a room of visionaries. Uh, I, by the same token, a room of all managers how, how transformational is that gonna be? So this is a great asset, and I don't know whether the other thousand out there uh, you know, carry this same mix, but you know, to those of you who are thinking strategically about what this organization can do and with whom, it helps to break apart to some degree. Not everybody is in it for the same reasons, not everybody has the same skills, and so the question is how do you find the right parties to work with on which issue, right? So this is a more subtle assessment than, than just you know, what organization are you in or what title you have. Um, uh, the other way to look at this, uh, to Heidi used the word turbulent, right? I mean, everything in the present has got a lot of inertia to it. Everything in the visionary you know, can be a little bit unleashed and you can dream. But that space in the middle of trying to do something different, hoping it's gonna break out, I mean, most, most entrepreneurs fail, but they try. And, and a, some really do break out. And so this space of, of H2, this uh, second horizon, is very contested. It's very turbulent by definition. And some things look like they're going to be amazing innovations, but they end up being essentially adopted into business as usual. Right? Hybrid cars are great until you realize that they might just be a cheap way to drive more. And it isn't doing very much for our car culture. Um, uh, on the other hand, if that hybrid technology is the gateway to getting out of fossil fuels, then it could be pretty, pretty great. Um, so you could look at the same innovation and say, ah, oh, it's going to break one way or the other. And, and part of the job of change makers is which way do we take it. Um, so this turbulent thing um, can actually cause people to look upon each other in very particular ways. Right? So very often, if you're, if you're a manager, how do you, and, and you're sort of concentrating on management. Let's give this sort of the negative mindset. Right? How do you look upon the entrepreneur and the visionary? Just give me an adjective. What's, a, what's an adjective that the manager would have for the entrepreneur? Right? What, what's, what's going on there that feels? I'll give, you, I'll give you one just to show the exercise. Right? Managers look upon entrepreneurs as risky. Right? Why would I take that risk? Most entrepreneurs have things that they're trying to sell, a risk reward thing. And, and that's a hard sell for many managers, right? They, it's just safer to plan for the way we always do it. Why would I risk my budget or my staff development or any of those things that managers said they care about on something new, untested, that you know, who knows how valuable it's gonna be, right? How do the managers see the visionaries? Flighty. Flighty. 
Right, right. Irrelevant sometimes, right? Go, you all go ahead and have your conversation. I'm going to run business the way we always do. Right, that's all. How do the entrepreneurs see the manager? Exactly, obstruction, right? You're in my way. And how do the entrepreneurs see the visionary? Dreamers, right, exactly, impractical. What do you, you're not rooted in the world. I'm actually building a business or, or some innovation. You all are talking about something that doesn't exist yet, okay? And then what do the visionaries see in the manager? Absolutely. Dinosaur, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And what does the visionary see in the entrepreneur? Small-minded. Yes, you've compromised, you're sellout. What's going on, right? So how far can we get if that's our default attitude, right? We need all of these systems to work together and to transition. That, these are options on how to look upon each other. The other way to look at it is how could managers, if you're more charitable, if you're more positive, what would be a, a flip on how you could look upon, uh, a manager could see what the entrepreneurs are doing? Something a little bit more, uh, more constructive. Right, exactly. There's where the ideas are coming from. I can't keep running this business the way I always do. The world is changing. I need a source of ideas. That's going to come from the innovators. And what about the, what about the visionaries? Yes, of course. That's hope. What? I mean, I'm not doing this just because I want to tread water. I want to do this because I believe there's something better. And that comes from that. Okay, what about the entrepreneur? Oops, I gave the light too quick. <laughs> okay, the entrepreneurs see the managers, I need your support, right? How can I get this thing going off the ground until somebody in the present with the power green lights it? Okay, so the support has to be there. What about the entrepreneurs and the visionary? What, what are they looking for, for in each other? Inspirational. Inspiration, sure, exactly, nice. Uh, and the visionary on the manager, what do they look like? Yeah, that's heritage, right? That's where we came from. We can't throw all that out. Why would we? It, much of it works. It just doesn't work for everybody, or maybe some of it doesn't, but, but to be able to differentiate what's the heritage that we have worked hard to achieve versus the part that we really need to leave behind, that it no longer fits in the, in the future. Um, and the visionary, how do they look upon the entrepreneur? Yeah, that's an ally. That's somebody who could help make it happen. Sure, it might be compromised in some way, but it's a path, right? I've heard the three horizons talked about sometimes as the first horizon, the job is to be sort of hospice to the current culture and midwife to the future. Um, and, and you want to do both of those, right? And we want to be able to do that just in the way that those words hospice and midwife mean, right? These are fellow people doing jobs that we constructed. And if we're actually you know, tearing them down and looking upon them like, you don't have a place in my change world, then how are we going to get this job done? Probably not at all. Um, so, uh, quick honesty, this, I'm not going to ask for a commentary, it's totally anonymous, but if you're honest with yourself, do you mostly have the negative view, positive view, or does it really depend on, on exactly who, individually, you're involved with? This is nothing but for you to see each other. It doesn't, nobody's going to know who said what. This goes in the category of, it doesn't help to lie to your counselor, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, this is, this is great um, because in some ways, we, what, you know, we want to cultivate relationships that allow for the positive, generative relationship to happen. And if that means looking for the right individual, what, what that often turns into is the inside change agent. Yeah. You know, that company as a whole looks like the enemy, but somebody inside of it I can work with, right? Or I can't get this law passed, you know, today, but I can work with certain legislators um, because we can agree to disagree on many things and we can work on this thing. So being able to actually see this as person mediated is actually a way to get in relationship with the right people um, and to, frankly, to get out of relationships that are dysfunctional and um, and so sort of disorganizing relationships that, that don't produce change is a great way to reorganize around ones that can matter. Um, and you never know who those are going to be. It might be the, you know, the, 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 the so-called client 
in a clinical interaction might be the very best change agent in the, in the PTO, right, or in, in their city council. Um, and so looking upon people as having whole biographies and not just, you know, kind of a flat organizational role is a big deal here. Um, uh, okay, so I promised I would say a little bit about what we've learned from other multi-sector groups. And so let me do that really quickly. Um, the, the, as best as, there's no census of multi-sector partnerships in this country, very hard thing to measure, but a couple years ago we did, we've done two rounds of these pulse check surveys on um, if you are part of a multi-sector partnership, uh, several hundred people have contributed profiles and, and one thing we know is that these groups are forming very, very quickly. Just like Hip Cuyahoga came into being around 2010, so did a lot of others in this country, uh, pretty much right about that same time. And, we could get fancy about sociologically why then, but the truth is many of these groups are kind of recent. Um, I mean, some have been around for decades, but the, this is, by all accounts, a very new phenomenon in the American landscape of people leaving, looking outside the walls of their organization because there's things that they cannot do alone that they're trying to build together, and they build tables, you know, not unlike this group. Uh, flip side of that sort of recent formation um, and how hard it is to progress is that a lot of these groups are pretty early stages of development. If you think about that pathway, uh, lots of groups are still getting together, still figuring out what it means to have common goals and, and regional you know, orientations. Um, some are in the middle area and a handful, um, a handful look like they're a little bit further developed. But, but even the ones that are really, you know, sort of stand out against the pack have a very long way to go to be able to restructure you know, around the things that they've, they've stood up for. Um, one thing we learned, though, is that the things that groups do that propel their momentum look pretty different in the early going versus the middle and the later. And again, with the development analogy, you know, as an as a infant turns into an adolescent and an adult, they do different things that allow them to grow even further. So you know, when groups come together, engaging stakeholders, um, and figuring out what their shared values are, um, those, those uh, you know, turn out to be pretty important things. But, and, and they look for the easy wins. But by the time you get into the middle stages, those kind of run out of gas. There's only so much you could do by engaging the next new person and looking for the next new little win. By the time, if you're gonna make it through adolescence in this scheme, um, it's not like those are unimportant. They just become less important compared to the things that are rising which is taking a really long view of the future. What is, what, where are we going? What's really driving the momentum here? And exercising influence upward and out. That's almost verbatim of what you said is next for, for this group, right? You've been inward, but now it's about upward and out and over the long haul. Um, you can't lose H1 and H2 in doing that work, but, but that's going to become more important. Um, and so the, whatever brought Hip Cuyahoga to the present is, the message of this slide is it's probably not the same things that are going to bring you into the next chapter um, because you have indeed succeeded at some of those early steps. Um, the same is true for the barriers, right? So, you know, groups come together with, um, with sort of low-hanging fruit uh, and, you know, trying to find a way to build the authority, right? What, what gives us the right to talk about health and well-being and equity? Right? So groups have to find that authority, and they often find it from, from many, many sources. Um, and there's a whole discussion we can have about where the authority comes from and, and how. But suffice it to say, it's not any one, any one thing that gets these groups feeling like they could stand up and be influential. But after a while, that authority, just acquiring the authority, has to give way to something else. Um, and so the barriers that start getting more important are about infrastructure, difficulty measuring. Right? The ability to actually anticipate and overcome political resistance. Right? You now have a stand to take. You're in a system. There's, there's, you, know, you, have, you have relationships and standing. And so now being able to move that agenda politically, and I don't mean that in a partisan sense, but just being able to get other people to agree is a big challenge. Um, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go through the details of this, but you can have all these slides and, and, and get into it. But, the idea is to tailor your developmental priorities to the things that you're going through. Um, so I have this little question, uh, which we'll see how well it goes. But from what you've, just, just from what you can tell already, 
What do you think are the real frontiers, the <coughs> developmental milestones that Hip Cuyahoga is going to have to contend with in the future? You could just type in a phrase here, right? Um, this is just a, a quickie thing to, to see if you have a sense of what, what really is going to matter, allow this group to take off to the next level. What, what might that be? Right? True, true focus on equity, more collaboration, bring in the private partners, right? Figure out a policy platform. This is going to be the worst checklist <laughs> for the steering committee that they've ever seen. But, uh, but it's a little window into, right? Uh, policy change, coordinated integrated funding, right? Exactly. Engaging the younger generation. Getting people organizations out of the mental models, embrace the system, policy, several of these. Engaging politically to move the needle, social determinants. There's a lot of pretty similar themes here, right? It's, a, it's about digging in on areas that you can be effective and with your high ideals in place. Overcome the power, right? And these, might, these might be the kind of things that are going to take a while. You might have to build up to being able to do these or do them in small ways. But this is a signal that, you know, <coughs> if you wanted to do those things, you, I mean, some ways you got into business doing, wanting to get there. Now it's sort of within reach. And so that becomes the question of, you know, how does this group begin to move in these directions, right? Big implementation, right? Because now you've got, you know, a, a suite of, of grants and studies, right? So the follow through, even the, the, the discipline, the behavioral discipline of saying, we learned this and now we're going to do that, right? And so being able to build up that scaffolding of what are we understanding and then what are we doing? So it isn't just a lot of understanding and not much doing or lots of doing, but it's not on the issues that you really understand are most important. Um, digital divide. Okay, thank you for this. Keep typing them in. It's good. The group will have this as, um, as a resource as you go on. Um, but speaking of going on, we want to end on time. I'm seeing lunch get set up, so we've got a couple more um, pieces of this. Um, so I, I, a lot of what was just talked about is actually that, that process of converting ideas into action. Um, and the, the, the trick is stewards, people who act like they're interdependent, and are trying to you know, sort of deal with how things happen in their common sandbox. Um, it's almost always the case that good solutions solve multiple problems at once. A, a bad solution is one that solves your problem and makes something else worse somewhere else. Um, so it's, it's a property of interconnected systems that, that, uh, and, and the stewardship of them that you're going to be solving multiple problems at once. There is a fabulous sort of innovation in the last several years, started within the climate world, but it's, it's spread much further, is the idea that there are such things as multi-solvers, people whose traits are to look for and make um, uh, sort of decisions and actions that end up solving multiple problems. What are the characteristics of multi-solvers? No surprise, they're very rooted in place. They know what it is to, to, um, to come from here. They have identities around that. They're looking for inclusion I mean, in place, organizing around place is by definition a way of including all the other people who, who connect in and through that place. So, so it's, it's, it's inherently inclusive when you're oriented around place and it's no surprise that Place Matters was the genesis of this whole thing. Um, and so don't give up that. That's the very promise, right? Even as you start working on topics that grants will support, it still has to add up to a transformation of the place. That's what multi-solvers will help you do. Um, they're very persistent. They connect. They're creative. They reframe. And those are the system thinkers, right? They're boundary spanners. They're people who will, who will look for co-benefits, who will say, you know what? If you're making that change, it's going to set me up to do this or that. It's a very particular subset of folks. Not everybody has these skills. But as an organization, it's pretty important. Um, mainstream decision making. Um, doesn't really work this way at all. And I'm not picking on the county rankings and roadmaps. I love them, but, but they're the best example of this. So right? you want to move the needle? This is the main needle in our country on health at a county level. And their idea is all, you don't even have to read this graph. It's just a bunch of outcomes that are driven by a bunch of, out, a bunch of factors. And what drives the factors that drive the outcomes? It's called policies and programs. 
plural policies and programs, almost always planned independent of each other. One program is going to move that, one policy is going to move that. Occasionally they're grouped together, healthy eating, active living, but, but for the most part it's you know, very topically oriented policies and programs. Um, most of our databases are built this way. You can look for bright spots on how to deal with asthma and you go down the list. But what we do not have, and probably could and should if we were having you know, this work um, flourish, is portfolios, pl plural policies and programs that are built together because they're going to work better together. This is part of the genius of the original health improvement plan here is, yeah, we're going to have racism. We're going to have, we're going to focus on racism. We're going to focus on clinical transformation. We're going to focus on, um, on uh, you know, chronic disease. Th th there was a, a sort of implicit um, intentionality of a portfolio of priorities, and that can take on much greater expression here. Um, so what if we really organized the work and the, the funding and the implementation and the measurement around the performance of a portfolio. Um, we'd have to get pretty specific about what a portfolio would be because we've got big aspirations, we want to see inclusion, we want to see equal opportunity. Those words don't really get us very far if you want to roll up your sleeves and build a portfolio. Um, so one of the things that we did um, this last year was to get very serious about the different levels at which a portfolio could be built. One of them is you know, kind of at a personal level. People's health and well-being is, you know, sort of their individual perspective, their, their experiences, how they evaluate their lives. And the other way to look at it is that there are conditions in which people have the opportunity to um, be healthy and well and reach their full potential. These are not properties of people at all. These are properties of places, of institutions that, um, that you know, so there's a list of stuff that we all need from day one and throughout our lives. And if we get them, we have a chance of developing better. If we don't, we're going we're gonna to end up in some pretty dire straits quickly um, or, um, or if not at some point soon. So these two levels are important. They're important um, from a portfolio design perspective for, for a practical reason, not even a philosophical reason. These, um, at a personal level, those are states of being that rise and fall from birth to death and they fluctuate kind of all the time, right? And, and so engaging with people to help them be healthy and well in their own experience is one thing. But it, it ends, I mean, it begins when they arrive and it ends when they go. That's what it means to be interacting with another person here and now. Um, these vital conditions that we all depend on, they predate us, right? They, trend, they go over generations. They are the legacy that we inherit and they're the legacy that we're going to pass on. So there's a very different character to interventions and investments that focus on these vital conditions versus on the, on the things that we need here and now. Um, that was the beginning of defining a portfolio that is much more practical. Um, and so what we did, and I, I'll just kind of give you the gestalt of this, is it's really divided into three big pieces. Um, on the right side are urgent services, right? These are things that people in adversity might need, any of us might need, um, to regain or recover health and well-being when it's threatened, right? And this is acute care for injury and illness, right? This is addiction treatment, criminal justice. You can read the list, right? These are the top six things that people find themselves in dire need, and we pay health and human service resources. These are the big ticket items, right? This is what um, uh, you know, many of our caring systems are built to do. And, and sometimes they do it well. Sometimes they, they fall far short and are not scaled up and are leaving many people falling through the cracks. But on that side of the ledger is, a, is sort of the crisis response. The other side of the ledger is a set of vital conditions. The good news is this is not an infinite list. I mean, we can draw, we can draw very long lists of all the things we all need and want, but, but like those urgent services, we can also make a pretty short list that covers most of the things that people say they need. Clean air, clean water, you know, stable housing, lifelong education, meaningful work. Um, transportation, an environment that is stable, uh, and, and a sense of belonging and civic muscle, that, that, that I am actually part of a larger, a larger um, community and I can both belong to it and contribute to it. Those are things that there is no science on the planet that does not uh, justify all of those. You don't need a randomized trial to do that. What this does for us uh, in some ways is, sorry, let me just go back. Is, is give us a framework, I'll just look, look at it this way, 
It gives us a framework where anybody who doesn't get any one of those things means our job is incomplete, right? If somebody is left out or excluded or some group is systematically excluded, either from the urgent services or the vital conditions, then this job is not done. Right? We don't even have to use the word equity to begin with. We've now operationalized this as a set of things that need to be assured. And the question is, how well are we doing that? This could be, you're asking for a different way of measuring comprehensively. Where's our yardstick? Who's in and who's out? We're going to have to get, and I'm not saying this is the only framework to do it, but some framework of getting very specific about what conditions we are trying to create and opportunities and for whom, um, that would lead us toward a portfolio that says, OK, how are we doing on this project of, of building and perpetuating the conditions that we need, either here and now or intergenerationally on day one and throughout our lives? Um, so uh, last couple questions, and then we'll break. Uh, how do you think Cuyahoga's portfolio is doing? Right? Are you, is it about right in terms of vital conditions, urgent services, um, too reliant on one or the other? Or look, I have no idea. Can't even guess. So one thing's for sure is even the even the people who can't guess. Uh, well, let's let's start with people who can't guess, right? That's a fair thing. Like this is a complicated thing. How what does it mean to to appraise this portfolio? What does it mean to have a preference about what's too much and too little? Um, so we, it's proof that we don't organize any of our information or any of our discussion at this level. But that doesn't mean it couldn't happen. It doesn't mean it's not really actually something that a collaborative could do very, very well. Um, it, just, it just means that, that um, this, is, this is both issues of fact and issues of judgment that become very hard to do. And if you're not just willing to go with your gut, then, then this raises questions about how would I get better informed? What process would we have to do? What process would we have to go through to be able to both know and then, and then have a, a feeling about this? Um, on the other hand, other people <laughs> have a strong feeling that it's, it's lopsided. Um, my hunch is you're reading all the data that say that one thing we do know is that plenty of money is going in to the urgent services. And there's plenty of evidence that there's great value in the vital conditions. We're just not. We're just not really investing in that and getting that value. So that could be what's behind that one. Um, for time, we'll, we'll just move on. Um, I wanted to end with the idea of how do you get resources for this work, right? Because, because to some degree, this question is not, I mean, it might be rooted in things you'll discover about, it's not about money. I just don't believe those people deserve that resource. Um, and, and you know, it may come to orchestrating circumstances where people are very conspicuous about What's getting in the way of action on this? Is it resources? Is it uncertainty? Is it the fact that we can't implement that? Or is it that, that you have indifference and um, deny the dignity of other people? So we're going to actually end up having to elevate the, or unpack what's getting in the way of moving this portfolio in another direction. You're very close to doing that with the portfolio you've already got. Um, and so I just offer that as a direction that you could go in as this work um, develops. Um, so, resources may or may not be the real obstacle. I mean, of course, everybody needs more resources, but, but resources are dictated uh, and governed by values, and your video did a super job making that point. Um, so I'll just, I'll just go quickly. We did take a much closer look at not just a survey of partnerships, but 145 got nominated because they were doing really noteworthy things, and we were looking for OK, so just how well developed are they? What do they need? Um, so there's quite a long list. I mean, we were surprised when you really look at the maturity of these groups and, and get out and visit them and talk with them and ask other people who look upon them how well, how well are they doing the things they say they're going to do. Um, the truth is, a lot of these groups um, look like they're not quite prepared for the transformation that they say they want to do. Um, and there's a lot of reasons that, that hold folks back. But top of the list is they're just not paid for the value that they create, right? And I'll say that again. These groups, like yours and others, do a lot of incredibly valuable things that you are not paid really to do. Um, and, and so there's efficiencies, there's in-kind work, there's things that get done together. But it's not like there's dependable resources flowing into this. Um, and that creates a very 
um, difficult process for solving some of the problems above. Um, so this is a little bit of advertisement that we were so disturbed by this fact that th there is a lot of value getting done, but nobody's really getting paid for it because 90% of these groups are surviving on grants. And they're not even really thinking too far beyond the grant. We asked them, give them a long list of other things that you could get fi you know, means of getting finance. And, and, and not even do you know about it, but are you interested in learning about it? And shockingly low numbers of people say, I'm just not even looking for it. I need the grant. So if, if this industry, and I'm going to call it an industry, is relying on grants, it's, it's nearly impossible to get the job done. Your job is bigger and more valuable than grants. So we're going to have to think beyond the grant. This is why our team has published this thing. It's coming out in a few days. Uh, and so you can go to rethinkhealth.org and, and look and see how well we did on this. But, but all I'm going to say here is that the process of getting more money into this is not really about the money, right? It begins by understanding and defining what you mean by the value of a transformed system. Who agrees with that? Can you even articulate it? If we did an exercise in this room to talk to each other about what you see as the value of a transformed system, socially, economically, morally, whatever it is, I doubt you guys could do it well without a lot of practice. Um, and that's the nature, that's the currency of the realm, right? It has to begin with a cogent and clear, you know, here's the world as it is, the world as it could be, and the value of closing that gap. If you can't do that well, it's very hard to move much money. Um, Beneath it is distinguishing the value that comes from the interventions that you kind of mount in the world versus the infrastructure you build, right? The, the integrative functions or activities that, a, that this group is performing have a different value and a different set of, of interests around it than those that want to see, you know, the, the, the next new bike trail get built or something, right? So, so that's an important distinction. Um, and then, we've, of course, we've talked about portfolios that could really knit together multiple sources, multiple uses. They need processes of governance that only collaboratives could probably build well. But those are the gateways into being able to, to bring a lot more resources into this work. I'm not going to pretend that there aren't state and federal and sort of larger economic challenges, but scarcity of money is not exactly the issue. It's, it's really the architecture on where that money flows and why and to whom. Um, uh, yeah, so there's a bunch of resources in this workbook and we've learned a lot of that through the field work with other partnerships. Some do the value proposition well, but they can't build, they can't handle the governance, right? They can't figure out who's gonna decide what goes where or how we're gonna figure this out. So you know, it's all vulnerable to the weakest link, but if you wanna play in the NFL here, you're gonna need to both define value figure out how to um, sort of draw from a full menu of sources and link those to the full menu of uses that you want. It's daunting, but it's, it's doable. This is not rocket science, and it's not just the job of you know, the green visor crowd. This is, financing in this work is really for everybody, and that was one of the reasons why we, um, we wanted to make it more accessible with the workbook. Okay, so let's just end on the idea of what can you do here and what do you need others to do above, um, right? So, so to what extent do you have in Cuyahoga right now the conditions and capacities that are needed to do this work, right? How do you view the larger environment that you're in? Very enabling to very impeding. Um, no, I, I, you could take this bigger, right? You could, you could be, um, you know, sort of some things are working in your favor. Uh, for example, there's, pretty discernible shift to localism in this country where you know, state and federal policy can only do so much, but mayors and others have uh, um, a lot of latitude to, even under you know, uniform state or federal conditions, there's a lot of variation locally, and that proves the fact that local choices can affect enormous, uh, can, can affect um, outcomes in profound ways. So that would be, to some degree, a trend that's working in the favor of this work. Others are, are working against. Um, yeah, so no surprise here. This, the cards are stacked against in many ways. It's not all bleak, right? I mean, you, the, the, the fraction of folks here, like even if a quarter see enabling conditions, it's worth d digging into what that is, right? What is it that people see that they have latitude to do? Um, the flip side of this question, of course, is how much influence can you have, right? Because those conditions that you've got at the moment are not just a given, 
right? So how much influence can you have upward and outward, city, county, uh, professional associations, state, um, you know, more culture organizing? So we've got a good chunk of this room with a belief that you are not pawns in a big thing, right? That, that you're gonna, you could play on multiple stages. Um, figuring out, I can't think of a really more fitting way to end this you know, hour and a half dialogue. As big as Hip Cuyahoga's goals are for Cuyahoga, there are people in this room who believe that you can play on a bigger stage. And that that will then become self-reinforcing, right? The more that you could create wider change, the more that that's gonna allow Hip Cuyahoga to do what, what it's set up to do. Um, so I am the only thing standing between you and lunch at this moment. So, uh, so I'm, just gonna, I'm just gonna say we can keep talking about what lies ahead. We've got glimmers of what other groups have done in your circumstance, but there are not too many others in your league, um, which is to say you've come, you've done a lot, you've got a lot further to go, and you've got fellow travelers along with you that are in counterparts in other places that you know, are, are just as confused but just as committed. And um, you've got catalysts, organizations at, you know, of nationwide influence who badly want to learn from and support this work. And so you are on the front lines of probably the most important thing that, that there is. And Can I, you answer one question for me? Sure. With the existing political environment and the fact that healthcare is for profit, yeah. how does that play into this? How do you get to that answer? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I guess I will, I will use this as an advertisement for a workshop that the National Academies of Science is going to have on December 3rd, just a few weeks from now, um, is, is sort of taking up that exact question. If we have an economy that doesn't value health and well-being, like we have a sort of a market failure for health and well-being, what makes us ever think this is going to happen? Um, and that would be a very bleak thing if we didn't think that the economy could really evolve and bring values into the market. Um, and the truth is there are sectors in the US economy and other, other countries that have demonstrated that it is possible to bring health and well-being and the, the values for it, equitable health and well-being even, um, into, into what otherwise was a market that was indifferent to that. So we've got a movement for value-based health care in this country. It's been going on for a couple decades. It is still fragile. It could, it could stall, it could backslide, but it's not at zero. Um, and so we are today valuing health in a different way because the prospect of ending fee-for-service healthcare um, is turning into something different. Um, the same is true for business investments, uh, institutional investors, pension funds, corporate investors, even corporations themselves and how they use their money have so-called impact investing or socially responsible investing criteria you know, environmental, social, governance criteria. Those are things that never used to be in the capital markets and are now selecting for um, you know, fair, fair wages, worker safety, gender equity, environmental sustainability. Those are like trillions of dollars are flowing differently because those criteria are now in the capital markets than they, than, than they were before. And all evidence suggests that that trend is gonna get exponentially bigger as the, um, as the baby boomers wealth transfers to the next generation. Um, well, but, but the very definition of profit is changing. Um, be, uh, I, mean, I mean, maybe not enough, and maybe, I mean, uh, not maybe. Pro definitely not enough. On the other hand, it's not zero, and it proves that this is flexible, and it becomes to, to the point that was made by your colleague next to you. Those that show up and actually um, influence the values that dictate investment priorities can have a lot of influence. It's going to take decades, um, but that's exactly what um, has been going on, and that's what's needed in the world. Um, so a little, it's a great question, and uh, still a fine place to end on. So we should stop. So we just wanted to thank, thank you. you. Very much. I hope you're not giving me anything. I should be giving you. Oh, you. And just to Thank make you. sure you recognize this, this is a pick, you know, uh -huh. health and, and our skyline. But we also have these bones that represent our amazing football team. <laughs> more importantly, our grit and our determination. Right. So you have that. You so Thank you both. Thank you. Bobby, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank all of you. Um,